So uh, thank you for that wonderful introduction. I didn't know I had done so many things. <laughs> um, originally, I was going to talk just about inequality. And I was going to do this with a large database which has been accumulated by the research project which is run by Radhika Desai and myself. And the purpose of this database is so that anybody can discover for themselves the true facts of the international economy. So the first point I want to make is if you visit this website, you will find there links that will allow you to download all the data that I have used and to do something very important for science, you can check it for yourself. But if, if you find a mistake, and I'm sure you will, please tell me. And we'll put it right, okay? I then heard from the organizers that you wanted to discuss the framework of national culture and how national culture affects attitudes to international inequality. So I slightly changed my presentation in the following way. I am in the second part of my talk going to show that inequality between nations has been growing systematically since the war and since earlier. This is a phenomenon which development economists refer to as divergence. Now, the important thing about divergence is according to Western economic theory, it's not supposed to happen. What is supposed to happen as a result of the free market, globalization, capitalism, all the wonderful things that are promoted by the West is that the so-called backward nations, like China, are supposed to catch up. So the theory goes that the reason China is doing so well, which is offered by the Western economist, is because it joined the World Trade Organization. Not because of the policies of Deng Xiaoping, not because of the Chinese Revolution, not because of anything to do with what the Chinese people have done, but because the world has helped China to recover from its backwardness. This is the theory of the International Monetary Fund, of the World Bank, and of, I'm sad to say, the United Nations. So I think that this attitude, this cultural attitude to how China has grown and why there is underdevelopment in the world, I think this is a profoundly wrong idea. So what I want to ask is, why do the North or the West get it wrong? Why do they misunderstand the cause of their own wealth? And why do they misunderstand the cause of the poverty of the South, of the rest of the world? And why do they misunderstand the reasons that China is catching up? So I'm talking about cultural attitudes, but I want to use a Marxist uh, approach to cultural attitudes and suggest that, as Marx himself puts it, being determines consciousness. So I want to say, I think this complements many of the things that Hippo was saying, that this cultural attitude of North America is a product of a material circumstance, which is the relation between the economic relation between the United States and the rest of the world, but that this relation is concealed by the market. So they don't see it, it's not obvious. You can only see it if you study it by the use of theory. And they have a wrong theory, and their theory is one that supports their prejudices. This is a very common mechanism that leads to people making errors, is they like to be confirmed in their own beliefs about themselves. So they adopt theories that confirm 
what they like to believe about themselves. And that, that's what I'm going to talk about. I've used a word because I thought we were talking about culture and the origins of Western attitudes. Let's take a, a phrase from the very beginnings of Western civilization, the concept of either hubris or hubris or hubris, I think it should be pronounced, a Greek word, an ancient Greek word, which I want to link to this doctrine I'm going to call Northern Exceptionalism. You may have heard of the phrase United States Exceptionalism, that the United States believes it is entitled to do things that no other country is entitled to do, such as interfere in other people's elections. Nobody has the right to interfere in the United States elections. It's a crime for the Russians even to publish information and put it at the disposal of the American people. But America has the right to talk with the leaders of the color revolution in Hong Kong in order to change the government in Hong Kong. Why? Because they have a right that the Russians do not have. This is exceptionalism. So I'm going to link the notion of exceptionalism to the notion of hubris. That's what I'm going to try and do. Now I'm going to make a tremendous gamble and push a button and hope that I don't get four Beatles. <laughs> ah! Good! Now, in Greek culture, Hubris and Nemesis were two gods. Well, actually, Nemesis is a female god, which is very interesting, actually, because the, the function of Nemesis is to punish hubris, which is a male trait. Hubris is a Greek word which means excessive pride or self-confidence. Now, it features a lot in Greek tragedy, particularly Athenian tragedy, which is really the beginnings of modern Western theatre, not of Chinese theatre, but of Western theatre. And it means excessive pride towards or defiance of the gods, leading to nemesis. This definition is taken from the most accepted English dictionary in the world, the Oxford, Oxford English Dictionary, the OED. And nemesis is a Greek god who punishes who? It punishes you for being too proud and brings you down to your knees and eventually, usually in Greek tragedy, kills you in very gory ways. Like Oedipus who suffered um, having to put his eyes out, for example. So the Oxford Dictionary says it's a synonym of arrogance, conceit, haughtiness, pride and vanity. I think it's a fairly good description of the general culture of the United States of America. Interestingly enough, the same dictionary gives an example of hubris, which it says, somebody mentions this, the self-assured hubris amongst economists. So the example of hubris they give is taken from economics. Why? Because it's the most spectacular form of hubris today, is a misunderstanding of economic facts, leading to thinking that your reason for being exceptional is that you're economically very successful, and that's the proof. You are rich, you must be good. You may have heard this American saying, if you're so clever, why aren't you rich? Okay, so if you're rich, it must be because you're clever. <laughs> now, what I usually do is turn that round when I'm talking about northern or western economics, and I say, since you're so rich, how come you're not clever? <laughs> Which I think is a much better way of looking at what's going on. So, I'm going to speak of economic hubris and its nemesis. And I'm going to take another leap. Yes! I did it. Um, now, it's well known that financial hubris was punished. Financial hubris was what was around between 2000 and 2008 when there was a tremendous expansion of the banks and the financial sector. And at that time, everybody believed that this would go on forever. I don't know if you had the chance to read the American economic newspapers at the time, but they said that between 2000 and 2008 was the biggest so-called bull market, the biggest period of expansion of the American economy, 
in history. Now I'm going to show you some figures from our database in a while, and you'll see actually that in that period was the lowest economic growth since the Great Depression. But they believed it was all wonderful. Why? Because everybody was making money. The bankers were making money, the traders were making money, Lehman Brothers were going, Lehman Brothers shares were going up, and everybody believed it couldn't possibly stop. That is excessive arrogance, that is excessive pride, and the nemesis of that hubris was the financial crash of 2008. That was nemesis in operation, punishing economic hubris. They thought finance was a great source of wealth. Now, actually, what's behind this? If any of you have the chance, I strongly advise you to read the work of a wonderful economist called Michael Hudson. He's a privileged to say he's a friend of ours. And he writes at great length about finance and debt, going way back to Sumerian civilization and Chinese civilization. So he studies the history of debt. And he's one of the world's greatest experts on debt. Um, and there are many famous American economists. I think Robert Reich has written the testimony to his late one of his books in which he says he's one of the greatest living economists. And he makes a, he, he has a wonderful way with words. He reduces things to their essence. And he says, debt is robbery. Debt means that you lend somebody money and they pay you back more than you lent them. That's what interest is. So the more you can force people to get into debt, the more money you can get out of them. And this is what happened in the real estate market in the United States in the years 2000 to 2008, is that they found ways to lend money to poor people, so-called ninja mortgages. Um, and they found ways to disguise what they'd done by reselling the debt and making it look clean, when in fact it was very dirty. So what was happening? It was just a form of organized robbery. And it collapsed when the people being robbed couldn't pay anymore. It's very simple. It's, it's actually extreme. Most, most economics is actually extremely simple. It's only made to look complicated by the use of mathematical formulae which are basically borrowed from astrologers. So I'm going to go beyond that and talk about the wealth of the North in general, not just the banks, but why are the clever countries of the North, why are they rich? And I'm going to show that that actually also is because they have engaged in systematic robbery. And the people they have robbed are the 80% of the world who live in the poor countries. And I'm going to suggest that China is their nemesis. But we'll come to that. Now, first of all, what do I mean by this phrase, the global north? Well, economic theories are often associated with countries. So for a long time, people spoke about Western economics, Eastern economics, and so on. What is called mainstream economics, sadly, this is what is taught in many economics departments in China, what is called mainstream economics is actually the economic theory of the dominant countries. That's all it is. And it is used by those countries to justify their own belief in their own superiority. So by teaching neoclassical economics in your own economics departments, you're teaching the ideology of the United States. You're teaching a doctrine whose purpose is to explain that the United States is correct and you are wrong. So I think this is one reason to be very careful about neoclassical economics, but there are many others. Not the least, it gets everything wrong, so it didn't predict the, night, the 2008 crash, and many other things it gets wrong. Now, mainstream economics is really the economic philosophy of the dominant group of countries. Now, I'm going to come on to who are they? Who are the dominant countries? Who are the rich countries in the world? And this is really obscured by most of the official statistics. I don't know if you know this, but if you look at the World Bank or United Nations, 
There is no classification that tells you whether a country is from the advanced, industrialized, or developed world or not. Only the IMF even has a classification which allows you to talk about the subject. But actually, the people that are now called the Global North are the historic colonizing nations of the late 19th century. And I want to suggest to you that this is an extraordinarily stable group. It really has not changed at all. And the only reason people think it has changed is because the classification systems of the World Bank, the United Nations, and the IMF disguise the fact that it has not changed. It consists of Europe, America, and Japan. Approximately one billion people live there. They are, the population is one-sixth of the world's population. So it's quite a small minority, really. People talk about the 99%. They don't talk about the fact that 99% um, of the 99% live in one-sixth of the world's population. Now, the only country that really has moved from being not part of that group to being part of that group is South Korea. Sometimes Taiwan is included as a country which is supposed to have joined that group. And at one stage, countries like Singapore were added. But the only countries that have really joined are some very small European countries, Ireland, Malta, Iceland. Also, Israel is now classified, I think Cyprus is now classified by the IMF as an advanced country. Then you have a lot of confusion because there are small, rich parts of the South. And by the South, I mean, by the North, I mean all this lot. And by the South, I mean everybody else except China. I'm going to say later on that, in my opinion, China has now left the South. It's a, it's a, it's a category of its... Pardon? Well, I'm going to critique the yeah. notion of emerging a yeah. bit. Because one of the problems I have with emerging is it already suggests that you are backward and the others are advanced. Okay? But in fact, that's a myth. It's a myth. The reason that the so called emerging countries were not em didn't emerge 100 years ago is they were prevented from doing so. So I prefer the term dependent countries okay. to emerging. But that's, that's one of the problems we're going to deal with in, in looking at the vocabulary that is used to talk about people. Now, if you look at these small countries, they're sometimes given as an example of how really it's possible to become rich. Well, what is the example? Singapore is really a city-state. The only reason that Singapore was able to have, well, there were two reasons it was able to prosper. First of all, it had an absolutely tyrannical dictatorial leader, Sing Man Rhee, and nobody talks about the human rights violations of uh, Singapore population under Sing Man Rhee. He's just described as a great leader in the West, okay? Because he made his country fully capitalist. But second, because Singapore is separated from Malaysia. And if you look at the rest of Malaysia, it's just another poor country. Its, in, its income per capita is about one-tenth the income of Singapore. So it's only because it's been separated out that it perpetuates this myth. And the other things are what I call oil wells with borders, like Brunei, Kuwait, and so on. They are carved out of the South in order to keep control over a scarce resource. But they're not really nation states in any meaningful sense of the world. The top 16 countries in the list of non-Northern countries, which appear quite rich, all have a population of less than one million. So they're a tiny part of the world's population. In reality, the world is divided into these, China, and everybody else. So I want to get a name for that that is neutral. There are many names you find in the past literature. For example, first and third world. That's probably the best. I think Mao was the person who actually coined the term the third world. I'm not sure I believe that he popularized it. It was a, a, a rather obscure French writer who first invented it. But I still don't like the idea of first and third because it implies that first is better than third. And I don't like the idea of emerging or developing 
or backward, which what we used to be calling them, because all of it has the implication that the rich countries are rich because they have achieved something that the other countries have not. I want to get right out of that, so I'm going to use a neutral term, global north and global south. But that's why I'm using the word north. Now, then you have the cultural ideology of the north, which is what I call northern exceptionalism. Because I think the exceptionalism of the United States is shared by Europe, to a lesser extent by Japan, because it was defeated in the Second World War. But it certainly had a strongly exceptionist attitude before the Second World War. It believes it was entitled to conquer Manchuria, to make slaves of Chinese people, and every, everything that it, which is just still not apologized for, as far as I know. So the notion of Japanese exceptionalism has not actually gone away. And it's certainly part of a world which believes that its duty is to protect its wealth against the terrors of China and Russia. Now, what is the core belief of northern exceptionalism? It's that northern economy, economies are rich because they are exceptional. They're naturally better than everyone else. Culturally better, they have greater wisdom, they were there first, they have the benefits of the historical civilization of Europe behind them, they're enlightened, everything you could possibly think. But actually, I'm going to show they're rich for the same reason as the financial sector. They're very good at robbery and bribery. That's their chief achievement. But they do it in a way that uses the world market to rob the rest of the world. And that's what I want to try and demonstrate. So the mechanism is concealed by the working of the market. It appears natural. This is the origin of northern racism. Because exceptionalism is actually profoundly racist. It says the South is poor because they're inferior. That's the origin of racism, is the notion that the people who live in poor countries are poor because in some sense, either mentally or culturally or physically, they are lazy, they're, not, they're stupid, they're not capable of doing what we do. Because how else can you account for the fact that we are rich and they are poor? if you don't have an economic explanation. The only explanation has to be psychological, cultural, and that means you're saying they are inferior people. And this infuses the language, which is why I don't like backward developing or emerging because of that. Uh, emerging is the kindest word. I think. Yeah, yeah, I think it could be somehow something What about majority? I don't mind. We can discuss possible alternatives. Yeah. I know I'm not very happy with North and South. I just use it because that's in current use amongst dependency theorists and it's the least has the least implications of inferiority or superiority. But actually the primary cause of northern wealth is the exploitation and oppression of the South. And this is known historically, but I'm going to try and show that it's happening today. It hasn't stopped. In other words, to put it another way, colonialism is still with us. It just takes the form of economic colonialism. So, if you look at where northern capitalism came from, it began with enormous reserves, absolutely huge reserves extracted from the south. People forget where the silver and gold came from. It came from the mines in what is now Bolivia. And it's quite ironic that we've just had a military coup in Bolivia, the purpose of which is to suppress the majority Indian government of Bolivia. Because I'll give you a figure. The number of people who died in the silver mines was nine million. That's just the people who died, not the people who worked there. The people who work there, nobody has a proper count. It's probably 30 or 40 million. Now, you compare that with the size of the working population of Europe at the time, it's about three times as big. I'm not including the peasant population, just the paid wage workers. So actually, the origins of northern wealth was the massive super exploitation of a labor force that was virtually enslaved and killed. That was the origin. That's where the gold came from. Slavery. Again, an absolutely massive destruction of the wealth and exploitation of the wealth of, of people taken from Africa and sent to America. Created American wealth, created King Cotton, created 
Cotton was the basis of the Industrial Revolution, remember that. So the Industrial Revolution, which replaced wool by an imported material from the South, arose precisely because of slavery. It is as simple as that. The vandalism of East Asia, the plantation economy, rubber, everything else that you know about, and the, you know, the destruction of the independence of the ports of China, is all the opium wars, these are all well-known parts of history. Hong Kong itself came out of that. And also the colonial, and not least, the colonial tribute of India. Now, a friend of ours, a friend of Radhika's, uh, Utsa Patnaik, and um, her husband, whose name I'll definitely forget, Prabhat Patnaik, have done some wonderful work on showing the quantity of taxes paid by Indians to Britain. And basically, Britain managed to keep its industries to create its industries on the strength of the money that it got out of India in the form of tax. So it all started with the colonies, as Marx himself actually says. The point is, this is not stops. It takes the form of what used to be called unequal exchange. It continues to divide the world into two great blocks. And the key to this is that there is a division of labour in the world. The North has a monopoly of advanced technology. And the South is used as a reserve for producing minerals, food basics, and cheap labor. That's why Hawaii is the target of Donald Trump. Because Huawei, sorry, Huawei, demonstrates that China, a non-Northern power, can become and technological power equal to the rest of the North. And it's not just China itself, but the example that sets to everybody else. Because it shows you don't have to accept your status as backward or emerging. Anybody can do what China has done. That's the real threat involved in what's happened. Um, this monopoly was something that was established at this point. Marx actually refers to it. He says that the birth of capitalism established what he calls a hinterland for capitalism, a mineral, agriculture, and labor reserve. And the thing is that people used to know that because it was accompanied by invasions. So that the colonies were actually colonized. There were troops there that put rebellions down and kept the people. Now, there are allegedly independent nations, but the, divi the economic division persists. And we're going to look at the politics of it in a bit. But now let's turn to Nemesis. I'm sorry the type here is a bit small, but I hope you can read it. I think the first Nemesis, or the first blow struck by Nemesis, was the Russian and Chinese Revolution. And probably the Vietnamese Revolution should be included in that. When countries began to simply escape the political dominion of the North, but not only escape the political dominion, but escape the economic dominion as well and say, we are going to build our own economy. Now, many countries rebelled against colonial occupation, but did not become economically sovereign. The classic example is Ireland. And there's a famous saying of James Connolly, one of the liberators of Ireland, in which he said, uh, you, can, you can kick the, the English out tomorrow, but as long as you let her landlords own your land, as long as you let her bankers roll, England will still rule. It will rule you through your landlords, through your own ruling classes. That was the relation that was established post-colonial in uh, Africa, in, in India to some extent. I mean, there are, there's a spectrum of the extent to which people actually achieved economic sovereignty. But I would say the only countries which had shown, achieved total economic independence and sovereignty were Russia and China because they established their own economic system determined by their own needs. Now, I've talked about why that's important. It breaks the technological monopoly of the North. It shows a southern country can defy orthodoxy, but it also shows the basis for a different world order. Now, this is very important, because I'm going to talk about how the northern economies are actually in a state of decline, which, again, is concealed by the facts, and that the southern economies are beginning to overtake them in terms of real growth. This is not realized, in terms of a difference in inequality, but it is definitely happening. So 
The South at present takes part in what China is doing. People trade with China. So China, through the Silk Belt and Road, has many friends. But very few countries are actually following the Chinese road. You don't find socialism with Congo Democratic Republic characteristics. You don't find socialism with Indian characteristics. It doesn't mean India doesn't trade with China, and that's very important. But it's not the only countries that are actually following an independent course are countries like Venezuela, and they're the ones that meet the strongest attacks. If you look at who Donald Trump is trying to shoot down, it's exactly those countries which are seeking to become economically independent. Iran is another case in point. Why is Iran the enemy and Saudi Arabia our friend? You know, the dictator that was, that, you know, nobody even votes, never mind voting being suppressed, right? But he's the great friend that we can sell all our armaments to and so on. Why? Because Iran is attempting to seek an economically independent course of development. Now, Russia then is one of the prime targets. So we talked about Russia being excluded from FIFA. We've talked about the many campaigns against Russia. I think it's important to maybe briefly summarize what I think is the focus of that, what the attention is. It's the hope is that Russia will return to being a subordinate country to the United States, which was what it was on the way to doing in 1987 before Putin came to power. So I think the hope is that Russia will turn against China. I believe that's why they're doing it. And that's why I think that um, Eurasia, the integration of Russia and China, is probably the single most important thing that's actually happening in the world today. So it's the greatest threat to the North. Okay, what is the response of <laughs> Star Trek? <laughs> yeah, the Empire, Star Wars. The Empire Star Wars. Strikes Back. It really reminds me of Star Wars. Its strategy <laughs> is to prevent political and economic integration. Yeah. That's what I think it's trying to do. It's, uh, there's an old frame. There's an old saying that if you can't keep your friends together, keep your enemies apart. <laughs> that's, that's what America is trying to do. Divide everybody up into bits. And if you look, their whole war strategy, they have regime change, and then they split nations into smaller and smaller parts. They divide up Yugoslavia. They divide up the Soviet Union. And now they want to divide up China. I mean, after Hong Kong, there are people in Hong Kong who have maps showing the Japanese map of China, divided into four or five different regions. They're already devising maps which divide China up, because that's what the North relies on. It relies on keeping 80% of the population of the world from getting together against them. Okay. Then it gets more and more desperate, and we're going to look at why it's getting desperate, why the hubris is getting worse. So you have, it's moving missiles right up to Russia's border in Eastern Europe. It's expanding NATO. You now have Pacific countries, which are part of the North Atlantic Treaty Alliance. So Colombia has joined NATO, which is an absurdity. It really is. You have the aggression in the South China Seas. You have, Latin America is on the verge of a new civil war. I mean, I could go into that if we have the time, but there's, there's a conflagration going on in which all the different countries are pitted against each other with Venezuela, Argentina, and um, uh, Mexico on one side, and the other countries like the, the, the dictatorships, Brazil and so on, on the other. So it, it's very, uh, on the demonization of Iran, the conversion of the Middle East into a war zone, things are actually in a quite desperate state now. They support fascism openly in Ukraine, and they support very corrupt dictatorships like Saudi Arabia. They support color revolutions. So exceptionalism has become almost the dominant way that the North is now organizing. And uh, I've already mentioned this, so we'll move on to the next one. So what are the origins of hubris? I'm going to ask, what are the economic origins, and why does the North not understand them? I'm going to show that this, this particular cultural phenomenon is determined by that economic material relationship. So the nemesis of the North really consists 
that the real economic relations are asserting themselves over imaginary ones. That's what's really going on. The real is coming through. A nemesis represents, in some sense, the triumph of the real. This graph shows the rate of growth of the North. This is an average from 1949 till nearly the present. It's an average of all the countries I mentioned, the dominant colonial group. It has declined systematically since just after the war. It used to be 7 or 5%. Then it dropped around 3 or 4 percent after the great slump of 1974, and then after 1997 it started to go down even more. It's now around about 1 percent, which is extraordinarily low. That's almost stagnation. So the second problem, and this is why things are getting worse, is that the North itself is in decline. So the hubris really is excessive pride because they have nothing to be proud about. <laughs> and that's why they're so desperate because they got to where they are by robbing everybody else. Now they're in a state of decline. They have to rob everybody else even harder. This is not an artifact of the data. I constructed this graph quite carefully. This takes every economic cycle. You know that economic cycles go up and down. There's recessions and... And, and, and booms. So what you do is you take the average growth between the troughs of each recession. And it actually, with the this, exception of this little blip here, in every successive business cycle, it's gone down. And as I said, since the financial crash, it's only been 1%, and its previous lowest was the period in which all the newspapers were saying it's the greatest boom the world has ever had. It's also the whole North. This is very important. Some people say it's just America. Or now, I don't know if you know, but Germany is suffering in its manufacturing se uh, sector uh, a growth rate of minus 4%. Germany is in recession. Okay? So people say, well, it's just Germany, or it's just America, or it's just Japan has been in recession for the last 20 years. No, it's just Japan. No, it's all of them. This is the growth rate of the main countries of the North between 1950 and 2017. Now you can see there's some outliers. Japan and Spain grew very fast, averaged over that whole period. And Denmark and the United Kingdom grew a bit slower. But basically, most countries lie between 3 and 5%. If we now break that down into two halves, we get a startling result. This group here shows growth up till 1974. So you can see that Japan and Spain did an enormous amount of growing just after the war for the first 20 years. But in 1974, there was a major slump. It was called the, the second slump by uh, the writer Ernest Mandel. After that, the growth of Japan and Spain was no different from any other country. So the whole of the North is going through this. They, they walk the plank together. And this is very important because you can't find a saviour. You can't find some country in the North that you can link up with that's going to give you a better deal than anybody else because they're all in the same mess. Now, this is probably one of the most fundamental graphs that I've ever produced, and I hope that you will all have the chance to study it. This is what I call monetary inequality. May I just check how is the time going? Uh, I think we have time until uh, 15 minutes. Since we have, I think, 15 minutes. 15 minutes. I'm not going to eat into your own time if I take 15 minutes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Good. That's all right. So the monetary inequality measure is this. First, it, it compares two nations or two groups of nations. And I'm comparing the North and the South. Remember, I'm leaving China out of this. I'm also leaving Russia out because it's difficult to get data from Russia before 1990. So what you do is you calculate the GDP per capita of the North 
So that's the average GDP, and we've already heard how GDP is strongly related to at least affluence, if not happiness. So it's a good measure of how well off a country is, is the GDP per capita, the average income per person. Then you do the same for the South. Then you divide one by the other. Now just to give you an idea of how bad things get, when you get to 2002, this number 20 tells you that the average citizen of the North was 20 times better off than the average citizen of the South. This is the greatest international inequality that has ever existed in the world. And it's not just between the rich nation and the top nation and the bottom nation, it's between one-sixth of the world and four-sixths of the world. All added up together. You do it in US dollars, but you can do it in any currency because it, dimensionally it cancels out. And it's also grown systematically since the war, with one exception, 1972 to 1984. This was the period of developmentalism. This is the period in which in Latin America, in Africa, in the Middle East with people like NASA, you had people attempting to establish economic independence, build their own industry, escape from colonialism, and so on. What happened in 1980? You had what uh, international economists call the neoclassical counter-revolution. So the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, and to a lesser extent the United Nations, became taken over by economists who said that we need a new arrangement in the world. And the weapon they used was debt, because there was a phenomenon called the Volcker Shock. Everybody in the South, particularly in Latin America, had been borrowing money at very low rates of interest. And Volcker suddenly put the interest rate up massively. Now, many people think, and to some extent that was, to solve a problem of the US dollar. But let's at least say it had collateral consequences. Because it meant that the South fundamentally became indebted. So debt became the fundamental problem of the South. This was then used politically because the International Monetary Fund said, we will lend you money so that you can pay off your debts. Remember, these debts only existed because the United States decided to jack up the interest rate. So they were imposed debts. They were not, they were not profligate countries who foolishly borrowed. On the contrary, there were lenders who foolishly lent. That's what really happened, and then raked it in by jacking up the, in by putting up the interest rate. So, the IMF said, however, in order for you to accept get our money, you must sell off all your state industries. You must deregulate your industries. You must enter the world market. You must open your capital markets and give us all your savings. And what followed were 10 years known, 20 years known as the lost decades. So in the period of the greatest market liberalization, you saw the greatest growth in inequality. Inequality doubled in that period when the market was opened up. If you ever want a most sober, clear warning against the idea that globalization and financialization is going to make you rich, this is it. It's not going to. It then stopped, and there are multiple reasons it stopped. One of them was China, because China had increased the demand for the products of the South to such an extent that commodity prices started to rise. So the South was able to get a much better price for its products for a while. Also, groups of the South began to break free. They, they began, after 20 years, they began to say, hang on, this is not getting us anywhere. Let's do something else. And they began to work together. You had the arrival of the BRICS, and I think the most important thing about the BRICS is not that the individual countries of the BRICS were necessarily doing very well, but they started to work together. They started to overcome the fragmentation imposed by the IMF, by the United States. So, noticeably, this petered off 
And it is quite notable, I think, that the level of inequality is now still worse than it was in the developmentalist decade. So we're not there yet. Nemesis has not yet finished her work, is what I'm going to say. So, what next? China is the exception that proves the rule. This is the same measure. This is the GDP of the North divided by that, per capita of the North divided by that of China. Up until 1990, inequality in monetary terms got worse. Now, one can make too much of this because before 1990, China's economy was not very open. So the monetary exchange rate doesn't tell you a lot. That's one of the problems in discussing what was happening in Russia before 1990, is that the, the country had an economic system which isolated the population from the effects of a bad exchange rate. You, you, you couldn't buy blue jeans, but you had actually an enormous amount of ordinary consumer goods just distributed to you through the, the planning system. Be that as it may, once you got the economic reforms, and once particularly you got the relation of trade with the United States, the true relation began to appear as China began to acquire northern technology. And over 30 years, the inequality ratio of China dropped from 60 to 5, which is one of the most extraordinary historical achievements that humanity has ever seen, to bring 1.5 billion people, at least on average, regardless of GDP, out of poverty. Nobody has done that before. Nobody. Also, there is no comparator. This went on for 30 years. You have other countries which have successes that last 10 years or 15 years, but nobody has continuously improved their relative position in the world for 30 years. Even if it stopped tomorrow, it would still be a historical achievement. Let's, let's hope it doesn't. So, what lies behind the belief of the North that it is superior. I think underlying it is what I call the fallacy of Northern theory. And this is quite an important one. And to explain it, we need to look at what's been happening to real growth. Now, this graph here shows the gap between the growth of the South as a whole and the growth of the North as a whole in real terms. Not in money terms, but in real terms. And there's a contradiction between this and what's been happening in monetary terms. Because the South has been, look, this is naught. So only in these years was the South growing more slowly than, actually in the developmentalist years, interestingly enough, was the South growing more slowly than the North or, or here. Most of the time, the South was growing 2% or more faster than the North. The South was growing faster than the North. And this took off from 2001 because of that blip we saw, and it's still much larger. So why is it that if the North is improving in real terms, it's worse off in monetary terms? This is a little question for any economic student. Very easy to answer, actually. Your real growth is increasing. You're producing more things, but you're worse off in money terms. It's because you're selling your produce for less. And the other guys are selling their produce for more. What do they sell? They sell 5G. They sell high-tech. They sell things at the top of the value chain. They sell advanced technology. And they charge you for it. Why are they able to keep the price high? Because they're the only people doing it. If the countries of the South were to be developed the price of these products would fall to about one half or one third what they are now. So it's a monopoly price. The price you are now charged for high technology goods is a monopoly price three or four times higher than what you would pay if the production was evenly distributed in the world. At the same time, the price of what the South sells, minerals, products of cheap labor, foodstuffs, the bottom dropped out of the market. Why? Because of what the IMF did was make everybody overproduce. They told everybody, produce cash crops, use your cheap labor force, and of course what they were selling, the price collapsed. And this is the graph which I think most of all demonstrates what's going on. Up here, 
These are all countries. Up here we have in GDP per capita. So if you're up here, you're rich. That's a rich country there. That's a poor country there. This is the price level. It's whether your goods are cheap or whether your exports are cheap or, or, or expensive. All the red countries are countries of the south. So the world is divided into two blocks. The rich countries, everybody up from here, which are the north, who also have high prices, and the poor countries, down here, who all have low prices. So the south is poor because it was forced to export minerals, cheap labor, and food. Not because it chose to, but because it was forced to by the debt mechanism, by deregulation, and the acceptance of IMF policies. This is robbery. Very simply, but it's robbery conducted by the market, not by armies, so you don't see it. And only China is breaking with it because China says, we're actually going to make our own technology, we're going to acquire our own technology. And Trump's trade war and the treatment of Huawei shows what the reaction is. Okay, we're nearly at the end. There's a conflict in the heart of Norton theory. There are actually two theories of development. One is developmentalism. That says everybody will catch up if you join the world market and you become uh, capitalist countries. But the other one is what's called the Par Ricardian comparative advantage. It's, it basically says you should specialize in what you do best. Now, what does the South do best, according to the North? It works for no money, and it exports its food and its minerals. So you should specialize in misery. <laughs> and the wealth in the north should specialize in happiness. That's comparative <laughs> advantage. Some, some of them. And you should export your misery. You should export your misery. How do you export your misery? Because international inequality is the biggest cause of national inequality. Because what happens is this, that wages are pushed down in the north because they're in competition with very low wages in the south. But the elites in the South seek the lifestyle of the North. So actually, inequality between nations is the biggest cause of inequality within nations. But you know, if you read Piketty and you read Milanovic, there is no mention of this whatsoever. In fact, Milanovic even denies it. He says, we don't need national inequality. We now study global household inequality. So the truth is just concealed that it's national inequality which is causing all the problems of the world. The single biggest solution to the problems of the world is for everybody to develop to the same level. The, the North would be much better off because all the products would be cheaper. The South would be much better off. People wouldn't be emigrating all over the place, causing all the disruption, and there wouldn't be social conflicts. I'm going to finish very fast, so I, 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 I must let the next speak go. So... What happens is that the North follows comparative advantage instead of developmentalism. The material follow, so it's irrational, the material forces behind it are the monopolies. Financial monopolies, extractive and high-tech monopolies. And it holds for comparative advantage. This destroys the prospect for development unless there is political resistance. So there are two forms of that. Individual nations, like China, like Vietnam, like Iran, like Venezuela, but also cooperation, Belt and Road, Eurasian integration, and so on. One last point. Nemesis is not a friendly god. <laughs> we do not want Fubri to go to the point where it calls Nemesis into action. Because Nemesis, her job is not to reward the people who have been the victims of Hubris. It's to punish the people who did the hubris. Now, the Americans can be punished by many means. For example, you could destroy the world through climate change. That would be a typical operation of Nemesis. Or you could provoke a world nuclear war. That would be a typical operation of Nemesis. Nemesis doesn't care about doing good. It only cares about punishing hubris. So what we have to do is get ourselves in between hubris and Nemesis and actually convey all the... Um, visions that have been put forward at this conference in order to stop Nemesis doing her job. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's, it's a talking because the speech was very uh, refreshing and uh, obviously insightful. And especially if you heard from the Western scholars who talk about this type, this essential difference between northern and southern countries.
at where street or interest in the city. But we, we won't have discussions afterwards after Professor um, Professor Desire's uh, presentation. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, 